you yeah. the bend. And she love me when I'm in it. And she never be pretending. Nothing is friend. She gon' tell you what she bought it. Cause she know you can't afford it. Know you can get it. Looking exquisite. No competition. Stay on the pivot. Hey, be watching. They be plotting. She's so motherfucking independent. Mama be Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the eSpot with Camille. And I am your host, Camille Cower. I am so excited for you guys to meet my good friend, Taylor Sharp. Oh, wait, Taylor Sharp, who's, who is a producer, a documentary filmmaker right here in North Carolina. He's based out of Durham, North Carolina. And he's got this interesting little niche that he's been creating right here in the home of basketball. I'm just going to go ahead and claim North Carolina is the home of basketball, at least college oh, yeah. basketball. We can claim that, you know, it's right? Hoop, it's the hoop state. We can we it can claim is. it. It is. No matter if you're on the Tar Heel or the Duke Devils or the Wolf Pack, whichever one you may fall through, or even some Eagle Pride, let me not leave out my HBCU schools. Um, I'm excited because you have a lot of hoop stories to share with us. But even more importantly, tell us how you got started in the entertainment industry. Well, Camille, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you always, and um, especially on this show of yours. But um, yeah, I think it's funny that we started talking about basketball and talking about North Carolina, because that was actually my funny way of making it into the entertainment industry and into film yeah. specifically. Um, just growing up in North Carolina, you mentioned it, Tobacco Road, all of these different amazing colleges, and of course, all of the pros that have come out of North Carolina, Michael Jordan, of course, chief among them, but I, I grew up a basketball lover, uh, playing and as a fan. And I think for a while there, as I was, as I went to UNC Chapel Hill, where there's such a great basketball culture, I think I, so I suspected that I perfect. wanted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, being I just, from Durham, I just automatically assumed we were on the same team, but that's okay. Hey, we can't be perfect. We're on, we're on the team of basketball. We just have, True. We just have different True. sides, you know. I still um, like Carolina. I just like giving people a hard time. <laughs> But I, I actually wanted to to pursue a, a career in the sports industry for the longest time. So I had a lot of experience working in basketball. Uh, my first gig out of high school was I went straight from high school graduation to go work to go work Coach Williams basketball camp summer camp for UNC and um, worked uh, different summers. I had a, some awesome opportunities in basketball with a with a nonprofit in Zimbabwe and with a sports agency in DC and with the league office in at, at the NBA in New York. So I kind of bounced around the basketball industry, but it was through these stories that I was introduced to in the basketball world that really made me uh, kind of be attracted to the power of storytelling. So it was my first documentary project, Hoops Africa, Ubuntu Matters, that I worked on kind of at the tail end of college that pushed me past graduation. That's when I really caught the production bug. Well, I gotta ask, cause in North Carolina, we have two big, well-known coaches, or well, maybe three, um, speaking of Dean Smith as well, that, who's already passed, but working with Roy Williams, that's huge. So what was it like working with him? Cause he's well-known for, I mean, he's helped Carolina win quite a few championships. So what was it like working underneath him? I mean, to start working with him, that's huge. Like, Well, yeah, for me, it was fun because, um, I mean, I was just an obsessed UNC basketball fan for you know my entire childhood. So then being able to go to UNC to be around the basketball was was already seeming to be really fun for me. But to be able to have my first experience on UNC's campus in Chapel Hill that summer before my first year started to be a part of the program in some small way that was a that was an awesome way to kind of set the foundation for what my college career would look like and. Now, don't get me wrong, I was not working directly with Coach Williams all the time that okay. summer. I was working with dorm staff, with all of the campers, with the other managers. But it, <laughs> but it is where I got to know a lot of the, the managers, some of the players, and a lot of the staff for UNC basketball that ultimately became a big part of my, my college years. I had, I had some good friends who played on the team and a lot of friends who worked for the team. So for me, you know, going to those games and cheering, cheering them on, it was no longer about being a, a fan as much as it was then being a friend. And getting more and more into the basketball industry, um, I think every step of the way, I've kind of got to to get an idea of what basketball means to people, whether it's as a player, as a fan, as someone who works there. Um, so it's fun now that a lot of my storytelling projects have continued to center on basketball because it's a world I have like such familiarity and so many connections within um, that I think I can navigate it well for documentary work and, and scripted work. And I think it's so great that you're doing it because they always say, follow your passion. If you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And to be a fan, to know that you wanted to work in the sports industry, sports entertainment industry, that can be a dream that not many get to follow through and to be able to follow through and work at I mean, 
that stadium is huge. And just <laughs> the energy in there. I've been there a few times. And no matter if you're a fan of Carolina or not, it's impossible to recreate and to be able to, in your films, like bring that kind of energy into it because you are a fan, because you grew up around it. I'm sure it brings a different narrative to your storytelling. So tell us a little bit more about how you were able to start with Hoops Africa and what brought, what coming from North Carolina, going to Africa, like what made you make that bridge, that connection? Because you wouldn't automatically make that assumption, but mm -hmm. having, I was around when Maktar Jai was at Carolina. So I automatically think of the fact like, that makes sense. Cause there was kind of like a pipeline at one point where there was a lot of um, athletes that were from Africa that were playing basketball. So tell a little bit more about that. Yeah, for me, I mean, I think at some point my uh, relation to sports kind of evolved to where sports was less about fandom and more about community. And as an extension of that, I think I recognize it could be a vehicle for social impact. So that's when I really got invested in, in sports in a deeper way, kind of more recently as I got through college and, and afterwards is kind of realizing how to harness the attention and the power of sport for good in some way. And that's where how Hoops Africa, the first documentary came together. Um, I had spent a summer, it was the summer after my first year at UNC. So I was 18, turned 19 while I was over there. And I spent this, this two month period volunteering with this awesome basketball nonprofit called Hoops for Hope. And they use basketball as a vehicle to teach life skills to 10,000 kids uh, across Zimbabwe, HIV AIDS prevention, conflict resolution, gender equality, uh, sense of humor, empathy, everything down the line. But it all comes back mm -hmm. to this philosophy of Ubuntu, this I am because we are. It's all about the collective rather than the individual. And I just fell in love with the work they do um, in the community outside of Harare in Zimbabwe. And my host little brother was young at the time in Zimbabwe, but he was a good basketball player and a great student. And he had dreams of coming to the States mm -hmm. for, for school. So there are all these things that I, I wanted to help get him recruited to the US. I wanted to help uh, raise awareness and raise funds for the nonprofit. But it wasn't until my next couple summers working with some professional athletes at an agency and then working at the league office, the NBA in New York, where I started to piece together this ability to, to coalesce some bigger basketball stories and weave in the Hoops for Hope story within. Um, so that's when the NBA decided to hold their first ever Africa game. This was in 2015. They held a, uh, it was the first time a US professional sports league had held a game on African soil in Johannesburg, South Africa. And um, it just, every the stars kind of aligned in some ways for me. And all of a sudden the idea of, for a documentary seemed pretty obvious because the NBA was doing this historic event. Um, Hoops for Hope, the nonprofit that I that I love so much was invited to come and do life skills clinics um, at, at the games, kind of surrounding with some local kids. And my host little brother, Watita, he was selected as a top prospect for uh, a top skills academy for top prospects on the African continent. So all of a sudden, I just realized there's this huge NBA thing happening, but also Hoops for Hope is there and Watita's there, and we should blend all of these stories. So that's what Hoops Africa became, was this collection of, of African basketball stories and really promoting the, the growth of the game and kind of the impact that the game can have on society. I just so perfect how those stars just kind of aligned for you where all the signs were there for you to make this documentary. So what was that first step like when you decided, okay, I'm going to do this? Who did you reach out, reach out to? Who were your mentors? Who helped you along the way? Well, this is a, a wonderful story. And I always, I always want to tell it too, to, to <laughs> give credit to my partner on that film, Dan Hedges. Um, and actually, coincidentally, I met him on my flight home from the first time from Zimbabwe. I had this 17 hour flight home and my in-flight entertainment system, you know, the TV in front of you on the, on the seat was broken. And I'd read all my books for that summer. And I think my phone was out of battery. And mm -hmm. uh, so the flight attendant was trying to move me to a different seat and um, there were no open seats. The in-flight entertainment system rebooted, but still didn't work. But fortunately I had this guy sitting next to me who was like, Hey, we can switch off some, you know, you can take my seat and watch the movies while I sleep and um, vice versa. And it turns out this guy, Dan, was a cinematographer also from North Carolina. Just happened to be on this flight from Johannesburg to uh, JFK, I think. Um, so we ended up forming a really fun um, friendship on that flight and kind of vowed to hopefully one day return to Zimbabwe to bring these stories of Hoops for Hope and Watita to life. 
So later, a couple of years, fast forward, once I was starting to get my footing in the basketball industry and I saw this opportunity to tell this story, I went back to Dan and said, okay, if we can get access to these games, if we can raise just a tiny bit of money to get us over there, would you be willing to, to head over to Zimbabwe and to South Africa with me to tell this NBA Africa game story, to tell the Hoops for Hope story? And fortunately, two years later, um, he was down to, to kind of go out on a limb with me and to start this project. Mm-hmm. And that was my first actual film project. So I, I credit Dan a lot because he had done a lot of, um, he had done a documentary before and um, he served as DP on a lot of commercial product projects. And so he had been in the industry, he's, he's um, 10 years older than me or so. So it was, it was nice to have someone much more experienced than myself who really knew the technical side of it. Um, and I could bring together the, the story and the relationship. So working with him really elevated, I think advanced my learning curve because I was just a senior in high school, kind of figured it out on the fly. Um, but fortunately, really the fun. NBA gave a lot of, yeah. they opened a lot of doors for us, or maybe more specifically, I knocked on a lot of doors and fortunately they, they opened a couple of them along the way, but a couple big ones that granted us access to be at the Africa game um, in 2015 and, and some amazing NBA players and, and people with the league were, were interviewed from Adam Silver to Chris Paul to Luol Deng to Giannis Antetokounmpo, you know, all these, all these big names, um, Paul Pierce, Doc Rivers, ultimately kind of heard the spirit of Ubuntu and understood why we wanted to make the film and, and they all got on board. And, and I, looking back, I mean, that, that was huge for, for where I am now, um, is to have all these Hall of Fame basketball players be willing to be interviewed in this first time filmmaker college kid project, you know? Um, I have a lot of gratitude for everyone involved in the project. And it was definitely an Ubuntu effort just to make the film. What a great start, man. You've had some really lucky breaks, but I'm sure with every lucky break, there's been some challenges. So what were some of those challenges? Maybe even just like raising the funds or mm-hmm. getting some of the no's. Like, how did you keep yourself going during all of that? Because this is like, you always bring the best stories. I'm so glad you had <laughs> another project to share for to bring you back. Well, it was it was kind of a serendipitous path that brought me to filmmaking and definitely a leap of faith for me mm-hmm. because I had put in a lot of time, internships, you know, hired project work, uh, whatever it may be to get a kind of foot into the basketball industry and to kind of work myself to be able to get, um, you know, opportunities at the NBA league office full time working in sports. That's what I thought I wanted for myself. But it was only when I started this documentary project that I like I said, caught the production bug and, and really fell in love with storytelling and wanted to figure out how to tell more stories and how do I piece together enough projects to actually make this work for a living. It's a very tough industry to break into, especially if you're trying to forge your own path. So yeah, and I mean, there were some Carolina, Like you weren't right in the big market either. So yeah, <sighs> so you high understand, school. you know, yeah, there's, totally. there's, a lot, there's, a, there's a long path of, you know, kind of that indie spirit and that grit mm-hmm. you have to have to push through and a true love for it. But I was, I think what was interesting is that um, I think a lot of people had some idea of support or an idea that this could work, that I could be good at this from the beginning, and that that maybe allowed me to believe that, you know, like when, mm-hmm. like for Dan to partner with me was the first thing for these NBA players to give us access to their stories and to be a part of the project like validated me along the way um ultimately i think that when i was finishing up my senior year i had the decision okay go get a full-time job at the nba working kind of on the business side of the the sport or finish out this documentary in a bigger way see where the momentum takes us kind of turn it into a feature film continue to see what interviews we can get what distribution we can get and i took a leap of faith and decided to hold a the week before graduation i held a private screening event at Varsity Theater on Franklin Street, Historic Movie Theater. <laughs> and um, as everyone was like, to saying what jobs they were gonna do after college and all of that, I was like, I think I'm gonna work on this movie. Y'all come watch this watch this uh, private screening of a uh, early, early rough cut. And that launched a crowdfunding campaign for us to raise ten, a little bit more than $10,000 just to help cover some of our costs right out the gate. And that was another validating thing of like, okay, people want to see this project made. Um, it extended its life cycle just a little bit, you know? Um, so th- those were definitely challenges, but I also say were like amazing opportunities. Cause when you, when you take those leaps of faith and they start to work, all of a sudden you become more and more convinced that this is possible. So for me, I just haven't looked back, you know, whether it's starting more projects of, of my own or getting freelance work to work and, and to partner with other people in the, 
in like the sports production media space. Um, you know, I've just pieced it together for, I don't know how, how many years now, four or five years now of post-graduation to where, okay, I think it like officially feels like a real thing now. Oh, I'm so excited for you. So when you, you mentioned earlier that you were working for the NBA office. So I know all the guys out there are going to be mad at me if I don't ask, what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what was it like working, uh, even some of the women as well, because I'm, I mean, I'm, I loved Entourage. So anytime somebody like worked as an agent or agency, I'm like, what was it like? Were there any Ari Gold type <laughs> moments? <laughs> well, you know. I'll start there. Yeah at, the, yeah. at the sports agency, which was an internship I did one summer. Um, and I actually worked for, there's a, a UNC alum, his name's Jim Tanner, and he's an agent and he's, and he ran, he runs a tandem sports and entertainment outside of DC. And that was such an amazing entryway into the sports agency world and, and to understand that because they work with their clients, the guys, the, the men and women they represent are just awesome people, like really high caliber players, but also high caliber people. It's it's people like Grant Hill, Ray Allen, Tim Duncan, um, Marvin Williams, players. Jeremy Lin, um, now John Morant, some, some big names, but some really mm-hmm. wonderful people too. So I would say my, it wasn't as much the Ari Gold story as much as it was this kind of like, you know, um, just really well-run family, family kind of feel in the office. So I actually got the really, the really sweet and the really professional and the really wonderful side of the agency world having worked there and, and getting, getting to work like everything from draft class to free agency to um, the sneaker deals to the, the community foundations that the players ran. I kind of got to to see a little bit of everything that summer, which was great. And then mm-hmm. at the NBA league office, kind of kind of the same, but on a bigger level. I mean, the NBA is like definitely a sexy job, but it's a huge corporation, right? You know, um, so that was the biggest office type setting I'd worked in. But it was kind of like walking around the office is also like a basketball museum, you know. So for the sports fan in you, um, it was really it was really cool to to work at the NBA, and I I have made so many great friends working um, at the NBA. There's, they really do a good job of recruiting good people to work there. Um, so it's a really it's a really fun, intelligent, diverse group of people that um, I've really enjoyed working with along the way. So although now I'm kind of doing my own thing in the production space, I really enjoy partnering with them and keeping up with them as much as I can because um, it's a good place to work in sports. Well, I can't wait to hear about your upcoming partnerships that you have with the NBA. But I just got to say really quickly a little bit. Um, I went to my first NBA game. Mm. I know. Can you believe it? Just recently? The past couple of years? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I went to a Hornets game for my first um, first basketball NBA experience. Yeah. And oh my gosh, the museum part of it all. Like I was more into just taking it all in, seeing everything like I have no clue who won the game. Not a clue. <laughs> it was just the entire experience of talking to everyone, meeting everyone, seeing everything, and the DJs, the experience of it all. And I can't imagine what it was like going to work every day. I'm sure you were very excited about going to work every day because every day brought new um, opportunities and excitements. But was there ever a day where you're like, this is the coolest job ever, or one of the most exciting experiences you had? Because I mean, not everybody gets to go behind the curtain at the NBA, especially in the big office. So Sure. Yeah. I mean, I really, I think I was pretty fortunate in the different, um, the different opportunities I've had at the league office. Cause I, I worked there for a few months between my junior and senior year before I, before I started on, on Hoops Africa, the film, but I also, they hired me back to do project work over the, in like the two years um, after that. So like one of the most amazing experiences for me was when I was, I guess, a second semester senior at UNC and they hired me to go do a project at the Toronto All-Star Weekend. So here I was like ditching class, ditching class for a couple of days on Wednesday, on Thursday, Friday, Monday uh, in order to go up to Toronto and to be paid to work for All-Star Weekend. And I had never had access to to go to a, you know, All-Star Weekends are very expensive and we had one in Charlotte, but um recently but at that point we hadn't had one since like 95 or something like that so i'd never been to all-star weekend and it was a dream of mine to go but pretty cost prohibitive and stuff and then i was hired and paid to go to an all-star weekend and uh, one of the one of the jobs i had was kind of to be like a player liaison to some vip guests who were um being judges at the dunk contest or who were doing autograph signings or whatever (laughs) so i did have this moment where i was like riding around on a golf cart with seth curry 
um, and we are racing Jordan Clarkson, and we are kind of in like the underbelly of an arena going from place appearance to appearance. And I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. I'm still in college and I'm getting paid to race a golf cart with Jordan Clarkson and Seth Curry. Um, so that was definitely one of those moments where I was like, you know, kind of a, a pinch me moment of like, okay, this is a cool perk of this job. And he's from Davidson. And he went to school in Davidson. So it was like another North Carolina moment where you're having like a NASCAR experience in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're speeding through. How fun. I'm so glad you were able to share that with me. The fan in me, I had to ask. So completely off of entertainment in that sense. But yeah, you know. but what, well, while we're there, I'll say another thing, because, you know, there are those like glory moments and then there are other moments where it's a hard working, you know, office yeah. like in the other place. But one thing I love about the NBA and one thing I love about the global basketball community at this point mm -hmm. and, and why I, I find a lot of stories I like to tell in it is because the NBA is just does such a, an awesome job. Um, you know, all things considered of, of their activism and putting a priority on social impact and, and social justice. I think as far as like the big, I mean, these big sports leagues, they're all big businesses, you know, but it's cool to see, it's cool to see the NBA kind of be a leader in a lot of ways. Um, so that's been another way to like feel really aligned with the NBA over the years is that, is that they always seem, you know, to be doing their part um, in, in broader conversations outside of sport. And, and that's kind of coming back to the whole sports and social impact thing and why a lot of my, you know, documentaries are, are in that fine line and in the intersection. Mm -hmm. I think it's like the NBA has just like a, a host of interesting people with interesting stories, but that go far beyond the world of sport and the arena of basketball. And so that's another cool thing about the NBA is I always felt good about um, working for them, you know? Right. Right. Um, with, everything that you were saying about the NBA and their being involved with social justice issues. And I felt like this summer, they really made a point of leading that charge of showing how to do it properly. And knowing that you add that aspect into your films, how do you think moving forward that sports should handle such social justice issues, especially now that we're trying to really bridge the community back together and build a better or climb those hills, so to speak, to build back better Together, what are some of your thoughts with all of that? Well, of course, there's work to do in just about every sector. And I think this summer was just a moment where it was kind of like could no longer be ignored. What was the important things to focus on and what wasn't? And so I think amidst the pandemic, I think amidst, you know, the I think amidst like the a lot of unifying around finally, you know, speaking out uh, about injustices and stuff, I think it was like this time where the basketball world couldn't stay silent and and they needed to kind of infuse infuse what was going on kind of like larger contextually societally they needed to infuse that into the games themselves if they were going to look themselves in the mirror and be able to play these games you know so i i thought they did a good job of you know if they're going to restart the season to do it as safely as possible which they did in the bubble but then also to incorporate a lot of a lot of messaging and a lot of emphasis and a lot of intention behind using this as a time to to speak out against racial injustice and to kind of like use the platform that the league has and to use these players with massive platforms and as mouthpieces for the Black Lives Matter movement. So I thought that was both necessary and very admirable that the NBA did that. Um, and I think that that's only going to continue you know, I think definitely there was this was a moment where players recognized kind of their power and the power of their platform. And um, I, I think that that will un, kind of continue to unlock new abilities for, for the NBA to continue to speak out. And so I thought it was wonderful how they really did a great job also just sharing how important it is about the pandemic as well and the bubble and explaining the importance of getting tested and being careful and social distancing and so on. And even the way that they were able to bring the audience into the different ways that they um, played the summer since that we couldn't be in the crowds. And thankfully I got to at least got, got to go my first NBA game <laughs> out of the way in yeah. real life. But um, there's like some more different things that the NBA has coming up, or I guess some people just saw this past week that you're involved in where the NBA is bringing even more things to kind of make sure that people at home feel more involved with the NBA. So can you share a little bit about a kind of a portrait of a hoop or so something of that matter that <laughs> I'm trying to hit to? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the newest project that uh, Blue Cup Productions, my production company here in Durham, 
has coming out is Hoop Portraits, which is going to be an anthology documentary series um, offering intimate vignettes of hoopers during pivotal moments in their lives. So this past summer, it was um, a little bit of a different pre-draft process than usual due to the pandemic. The, the NBA draft was postponed from, from June until the late fall. And of course, players couldn't travel around to do individual workouts with NBA teams per usual. They were kind of staying in their home markets and, and just working out with their trainers and whatnot. But, but yeah, we had the opportunity to um, make this short film called Two Ways to the League. And it highlights two of North Carolina's next up and coming NBA uh, players, Josh Hall and Tyshawn Alexander. And um, yeah, it'll be the first hoop portrait everyone can watch in partnership with the NBA G League. Uh, with our virtual premiere, and, and we're super excited. I think this project in particular, um, you know, it's pretty rare that you have two players who are coming from different paths. Josh was a straight from high school to pros player. He's going prep to pro, prep to pro. And Tyshawn Alexander was a three-year college player. So they've got different ways that they're trying to make it to the league, but they were living and training together during this offseason mm-hmm. for the NBA draft. And, and we had really intimate access with them throughout to be able to cover their training and and their pre-draft process all the way up to draft night with their families. So we were happy, you know, in a in a time when it was pretty difficult to do documentary projects, we had the opportunity to be able to safely produce, you know, a short film because we had we had two athletes, their trainer, their agent, and they were kind of already in their own bubble. So me and my small crew could kind of, could come in and join them for a little bit to do this film, but super excited for everyone to check it out. Um, and I think it'll set the tone for what this Hoop Portrait series has to offer going forward, telling these more these more human stories uh, of these basketball players, looking at interesting moments in basketball players' lives, but really getting to know intimately kind of the person behind it all. Yeah. Now, um, how did this whole project come about? Now, did you were you guys already thinking of like Blue Cup Productions? Were you guys already thinking of doing an event with these different basketball players, or did the NBA reach out to you guys about the idea that they were looking at these two players and maybe it would be a good project or so on. Like, how did they even come into your radar? Yeah, so kind of similar to the way in which I met my partner for Hoops Africa on a plane. I actually met Josh Hall, um, who's one of the subjects, one of the stars of the documentary. I actually met him playing basketball, playing pickup at the Durham YMCA a couple of years back. Um, he and I randomly, randomly, we ended up on the same team and, um, and had a lot of success that day. Uh, and because uh, me and my production partner, um, teamed up with him and a teammate in a random fifth and won 11 or 12 straight games. So we became buddies during that time. And he was, um, he must have still been, um, he was like 17 or 18 at that point. So I, I, he was an incredible player, one of the best I'd ever played with. So I, I knew he must be recruited and, and uh, probably going D1. And he told me where all of his offers were. And um, so this was still pretty early on though. So I just kind of put that story aside of, oh, it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what happens to him over the years. And we kept up over social media. Um, But it was not until this past February, about a year ago, when he decided I'm by, he was committed to NC State. And ultimately he decommitted from, from the team and decided to go straight to the pros. And that's when I was really thought that he had this compelling journey ahead of him because, you know, the last person to go straight from high school to the pros in North Carolina was Tracy McGrady back in the late nineties, you know, so this is a pretty, this is a pretty, um, you know, uncharted territory in terms of a, a North Carolina young person deciding to make this gamble on themselves, you know, not to go showcase themselves in college, but to try to go straight to the pros. So I think that combined with ultimately a really unique pre-draft process, not being able to travel around and be seen and be evaluated by all these teams that he hoped would pick him. I thought that was going to be um, an interesting storyline to follow. And fortunately, he gave me he and his mom and his agent were, were, were gave me full access, had seen Hoops Africa and had given me access to be to document his journey. And um, that's when we found out that he was going to be living in training with another North Carolina player, Tyshawn, um, who also was going to be going after one of those 60 spots. So having two players who were not guaranteed a draft pick, you know, but kind of chasing after the same thing, yet doing it alongside one each other, one another. We thought that would be a compelling duo to follow throughout the process. And um, yeah, we wrapped up that film. Our last our last shoot day was right around draft night and we edited it over the past couple months. And it was then that the NBA G League um, decided that they would love to partner with us on a virtual premiere to be able to bring this to their fans um, because it really, 
I think the the tone of the film really matches a lot of the the branding of the league of these people who are you know these players who are who have this incredible opportunity to grow and this in this incredible opportunity to make it to the NBA. Um, so yeah, it, it seemed like a really fitting partner to partner with the G League on a virtual premiere to to launch the Hoop Portraits series. And such a wholesome story too. It's nice to see. I guess like small town heroes kind of make it into the American dream type of thing. And especially like hearing the story that they're working for such coveted spots where it's only 60 and yet they're mm -hmm. training together to get, to make that dream happen for both of them. Oh, I can't wait to watch it. I didn't get to see it when it premiered. So you'll have to send me a link. Maybe I can watch of it. Course. Of course. <laughs> so I can watch and have my own private screening because Man, it's hard to stay up late for all the games now. They're all so different times and different, you know, like they keep changing. And I'm like, ah, I can't keep up. But it's just, I just go on Twitter every once in a while. I'm like, oh, my team won. That's all that matters. Yeah, <laughs> and there's so a lot on. going on. There's, but I hope you like this one and others too, because, um, you know, it, it is, they are from North Carolina and it is a, you know, path, th path to the draft type story of these two um, young players' journeys to, to the next level. But I, I think too, just like, the idea that it's all centered around this draft night where essentially they're for these two players, for these two people, their life's work is kind of culminating in this one night. And in many ways, you know, this night will kind of decide the fate of their professional career, or at least, you know, start launches their professional career. So to have access to that, I thought was, um, you know, a really, com really compelling way to, to launch this series, because I think it's something, you know, it's pretty unique for, and someone in another career, right? To have to have all of their life's work culminate into one night. So mm -hmm. it's it's inherently drama filled until the very end of this film, uh, and a, hopefully a celebration of the work that these players have put in to make it to where they are, and the work that they're going to need to put in to continue to make it in the league, which I think is a reality. Because every year there's 60 more guys, 60 more guys coming mm -hmm. in and trying to get those spots. So I think it's a pretty honest human look about what the experience is like for one of these players who's right on the fringe of getting drafted or not and doesn't exactly know what their professional fate will be. I'm like, you get to watch, see if their life is getting ready to change forever. And this is exciting. Well, I'm curious, speaking for yourself, what are, what are your plans coming up next? What do you have in your horizons? What do you want to see you do next? So we have more hoop portraits uh, in the works, which is great. We we are going to tell the story of another North Carolina basketball player um, who is actually a high school basketball player who's wrapping up his high school career and will be soon announcing where he's going to play in college. So similarly, right, there's this big moment mm -hmm. in this player's life to to decide where the next however many years of his playing career will be, decide where they will take on the additional opportunities of, of being student and having a scholarship um and this player in particular has a really really interesting backstory um the son of two south sudanese refugees who landed here in north carolina and had him soon after so there's this you know there's a lot going on in his story and a lot to celebrate as well in terms of the success he's having on the court and where that might take him so i'm super excited to to finish out that story over the next six weeks and to see where he ultimately decides um, to go to school. And so that'll be, that'll be a hoop portrait that's coming soon. We have a lot of others that are in pre-production that we, that we hope we'll get to, to earn, unearth and to tell um, over the next few months. And, and also Blue Cup Productions. Yeah, we have, um, I think the last time we spoke, we were kind of in development on some things that are happening now, which is great. So we, um, we do both narrative and documentary um, stuff and short and feature film on both of those. So we always, it's nice in that we are editing multiple documentaries at the same time that we're in production on one and we're in pre-production on some ideas and my mm -hmm. partner Holland is a screenwriter so we're developing some scripted stuff too and I think having a lot of different projects going at once given that so many of them have different timetables or different mm -hmm. realities of whether or not they will even come to fruition in the first place is really mm -hmm. good for us because we feel like we're always actively engaged we're kind of promoting the past thing, working on the current thing, and setting up the foundation for the future thing, which makes us feel like we're gaining a lot of momentum. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that the next year um, ultimately allows us to be able to make more stuff, you know, because this past mm -hmm. year, I think we were kind of gearing up for the, for the, for the post-pandemic time that we all are waiting for.
and realizing there's no time like now. So that's awesome. And I'm excited to hear all or see all the wonderful projects that are going to come out soon from Blue Cup Productions, as well as um, some of your features and narratives as well. So that's exciting. Now, how can everyone keep in touch with you, find out more information or know where to follow to see the next um, Hoop Portrait and so on? Where's the best place to keep up? So if everyone wants to go out and check Hoop Portraits, that's easy on Instagram and Twitter. We are Hoop Portraits and um, bluecupproductions.com is where you can go to our website and see all of the different projects that, that we're working on. Um, and me personally, I'm T-Sharp94, where I'm always interacting with your stuff and watching your interviews. So all of those are good avenues to kind of keep up with what we have going on. And, and hopefully there's a story that we're telling that, that interests some of the listeners on, on your show. I'm sure I'm sure there's something for everyone. I mean, kind of biased towards um, one of your um, narratives called Camilla. No, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. But yeah, that's and of course, you, you, you as an actor, too. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're I'm sure you're ready for for me to talk more about the narrative stuff we're doing. Well, um, I, honestly, right I was like, your world. Interviewing? if you need any interviews or uh, actors, all of the above, although I'm doing mainly remotely because of virtual academy. But still, North Carolina has tons of talented people. I'm sure I'd love to put out the casting calls whenever those moments are available. Absolutely. We we are excited to. Um, you know, the documentaries you can sometimes do with such a small crew. It's me and one other. It's me and two others. And, and, and we've been able to, to to be able to test and wear masks and be around small groups of people to make it possible. But narrative is more difficult, you know, especially when you're on such a low, such a small budget to be able to properly take all of the COVID precautions you need to. So I am very much looking forward to the day to be able to to work on a narrative, uh, another narrative work in North Carolina when, when we're beyond all of this. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to collaborate on, on one of those in the future. Sounds like a plan. I got it on tape. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a wonderful week. And again, you guys have to tune in, check out Taylor and Blue Cup Productions, everything they have going on and make sure you like, subscribe and share the eSpot with your friends or on podcasts, Spotify, everything else in between. So thanks again for tuning in and look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Have a great day.